This morning, we're going to jump into the book of Romans chapter 7. Now we find ourselves in Romans chapter 7. Have you enjoyed Romans? Has it been a blessing to you? Amen. Amen. I, I read the book of Romans several times, and even now, I'm still getting more and more out of this. This is truly an amazing passage or an amazing book of the Bible describing to us the, the, the concept of grace. Um, scholars have called it the gospel according to Paul, how grace has just really changed his life from the inside out, what it's done for him, because he got caught up in it simply because of who he was at one point in time, a, a persecutor of Christians. Uh, he would you know, do many terrible things to the church, and then one day, just in a moment, Jesus transformed his life, and he's beginning to discover more and more about what it's like to walk in grace. And so he, we find ourselves in Romans chapter 7, and we're going to be talking about competitive, like this competitive nature, because how many know we are competitive people? Anybody in here is competitive? You get competitive about anything and every game, everything, like board games, you know, any kind of game related, you get competitive. You get competitive about who gets the front seat, right? I mean, we just get competitive about a number of different things. And so today we're going to learn what is competing against us and, and how this operates in our life as a Person. So the title of the message is called The Rules Dominated Life Versus the Christian Life. And so this is going to help us uh, to kind of figure out the game plan of sin. Romans chapter 7 is enlightening. It is a very important chapter in regards to the game plan of sin. It really unveils sin's strategy over people and how it operates inside of our world. And so but Paul is going to tell us how we are to live in the Christian life. What does Jesus do? Because again, he says this in Romans chapter 6, that we're no longer, as a believer, we're no longer under the law, we're under grace. And so how do we shift our mindsets? How do we be transformed by the renewing of our mind, Paul says, when it comes to things that, and patterns of behaviors, or, or how, if we're struggling with sin, what, how do we overcome those things? Because Paul has said in Romans chapter 6, you know, that we're no longer a slave to sin. We're now living in freedom. We're, we're under grace now, and so there's freedom there. And so how do we overcome sin? Before we enter into, really, one of the most popular, powerful chapters in the Bible, when we come to Romans chapter 8, where he starts off by saying, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And what a, a legendary chapter Romans chapter 8 is. And so he is talking about uh, the Christian life, and how he's going to describe to us a very simple, basic principle Jesus taught his disciples. It's a called abiding in him. He says the Christian life is all about abiding in Jesus. In John 15, he will say this, Jesus talking, he would say, apart from me, you can do nothing. Which means if you are going to do something in the Christian life, you've got to abide in Jesus. Because it will produce fruit in you, fruit that will last. And so... This morning, as we look at this, we're going to talk about these three ideas that we're going to work through, com things that are competing against us. And like I said, we're all competitive in some way, shape, or form. We all have that competitiveness based on what it is exactly. It may, may, may be different, but we still have a competitive nature in me. I'm a competitive person by nature. And so I like trying new things. I like trying to uh, compete at things and see how I do. Um, and a lot of times I pick things up rather quickly, but there's one thing I've never, ever, ever, ever able to conquer, and that is skiing. Anybody ski? Anybody? I'm talking water skiing, I can't do. Even snow skiing, I can't do. It is something about those skis. They're possessed, I tell you, every single time I put them on. I can't do either one. I tried water skiing as a young kid, teenager, couldn't do it. It's like, have you ever seen those people that need to let go of the rope when they're in the water because they've crashed, but they continue to hold on because they think they somehow can miraculously pick themselves back up? That was me, okay? Uh, I just never could get it. And so I've also snow skied. I once went to Colorado in college, never done it before in my life, but I figured I'd just pick it up just like I've picked up a lot of different things in my life. And so I had, you know, there's like the, the different levels of skiing, right? You have the black diamond, which is like, be careful on this hill or you will die, right? That's what I consider it to be. Um, and then there's like this intermediate level, then there's a the beginner level, then there's like the bunny hill, right? Which is something I never wanted to do, right? And so 
this, I'm skiing, I'm learning, and I'm doing terrible, okay? Like, I can't figure this thing out. I couldn't figure out how to break, okay? Like, I just couldn't do it. And so I was on a hill, and I'm going down, and man, I wipe out. Like, I'm talking, the sticks that I have go flying, the skis go flying off my feet, and uh, they have like the, the, uh, the snow skiing version of lifeguards there, where they're like, literally concerned for my soul, and I had two of these, and my wife was there, I believe, and so she, they come up to me, and they're like, sir, do you know what kind of hill you're on? And I said, well, I'm just, you know, I think it's beginner, and they're like, no, sir, you're on an intermediate hill, and I said, oh, well, I will go to the beginner hill, so then I go to the beginner hill, and so I'm on that hill, do the same exact thing, people, I crash, the ski sticks go flying, the, the, my, all these things just go flying off of me. And guess what? Guess who comes to talk to me again? Could it be anybody else but the same two guys? They're literally watching me, and I'm sure they're having the, the time of their life. And they come up to me again and very gently say to me, Sir, why don't you try the bunny hill? And how many know that would crush your competitive spirit just like that? And so I was taught a very valuable lesson on humility that day. And, uh, and so this morning, we're going to be talking about competitiveness, things that are competing against us. Um, we're talking about the rules versus the Christian life. And so uh, we're going to be talking about three different ideas to work through in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 6, Paul says we're no longer a slave to sin. We're a slave to righteousness. So there's something different that's happened inside of us. Romans chapter 7, like I said, is very important. Scholars agree it's one of the most complicated chapters in the book of Romans. But it's also a chapter scholars agree on that every single believer needs to have the right mindset on because it will be two different directions you go in if you're not careful. And the one direction can be very dangerous as opposed to the other direction which can produce a healthy mindset. And so as we look at this, we're going to talk about it. The first point is going to be about the fruit that we bear, fruit for death versus fruit for God. And it's going to be talked about in verses uh, 1 through 6. And, it, and, we'll, we'll, and I don't know if you've ever, you know, when it comes to decisions you make, you'll, what the Bible teaches us is this, is that you'll start to experience the fruit of those decisions. And you're, so this is very important. Paul is going to tell us, like, you have to evaluate those decisions. That really will help you in what kind of fruit it produces. Right, and I've uh, had, I've tasted food uh, before that was pretty good, and then I also looked at food that I thought was pretty good, and I tasted it, and guess what? It wasn't good at all. It, the fruit it was literally tasted like death. Okay, um, I've I've had chocolate milk before. I love chocolate milk, especially as a kid. I loved that stuff, and I would drink it all the time. And one time I drank it, and I was chugging it as fast as I could because I loved it so much. And because I didn't know how much my parents were going to allow me to have, so I was chugging it all the more as fast as I could. And then I realized it was spoiled chocolate milk. And it tasted like hot sauce coming down my throat. Have you ever had hot sauce going down your throat? Just with nothing else? It's not good for you, okay? And um, that literally tasted like death. Um, And so today Paul is going to tell us about what kind of fruit we're bearing here. Are we bearing fruit that's death or are we bearing the kind of fruit that's going to be for God. And so he says this in verse 1. He says, Do you not know, brothers and sisters, I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law, is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. And so Paul gives us an illustration of a, of a law But then he talks about us dying to the law and how sin starts to operate within the law. How does it work? As we'll read later, Paul will say, sin sees the opportunity when the law was presented. It's like I've said several weeks ago where if there's a red button here in the room and I say, do not touch this red button, 
How many know you're going to be tempted to touch the red button because you want to see what happens? In fact, you're going to wait until everybody leaves just to push that button, right? Because why? Something is arising in you because you want to do it all the more. You just want to see what happens. Is it really going to do something terrible as much as it maybe sounds like? And so um, when it comes to being under the law versus being under the grace of God, we're going to notice some different passions that come out of it. So I'm going to give you a side-by-side comparison. You ready? So you need to follow me. This is what, what happens when we make things all about the rules rather than using these things as the tools. So reading your Bible is not a rule, but it is a tool that will help you walk in your faith with Jesus Christ. Praying is not a rule, but it is a tool that will help you walk out your faith in Jesus Christ. It's how you look at it is going to be so important in your healthiness, spiritually speaking. And so what can happen is when we're thinking under the mindset of the law, what, it, what it's going to be doing to us is going to arouse sinful passions inside of us. Because again, Paul would say this in Romans 3, you're not a sinner because you've sinned. You are naturally a sinner, so you sin. There's a big difference. I don't just wake up one day and just sin and like, well, now I guess I'm a sinner now. No, the reason why you did that is because it's actually in your nature to do those things. It's just part of who you are, and you've got to learn how to deal with it. And so when it comes to the mindset of being under law, what happens is this, being under a list of rules, what it does, it will create an unhealthy competitiveness in you. And you'll actually start to compare yourself and try to make yourself better than everybody else. When being under the grace of God, what happens is this, is that you start to elevate others ahead of yourself. Jesus said, I didn't come to this earth to be served. I came to serve you. So he learns, he's taught us to elevate people. And he elevated the least of the least of people. He did the exact opposite. You see, we're, we're, and Paul will say this. He'll say, mourn with those who mourn, rejoice with those who rejoice. He says that in another scripture. So we know how to mourn with those who mourn, but does the church of Jesus Christ across America know how to rejoice with those who rejoice? Do we know how to celebrate people and their success? that they have? Are we able to celebrate people who succeed in areas of our life that we are not succeeding? Are we willing to celebrate somebody's healing even though we haven't received our own? Are we willing to celebrate a job that somebody gets that we have not yet received? Are we willing to celebrate a child that has come to receive Jesus Christ that a parent has been praying over even though our child of our own has not. Are we willing to rejoice with those who rejoice? Paul is telling us what will happen between the two. And he's talking about the fruit for death versus the fruit for God. There's another part where it says, well, you can have a judgmental attitude towards everybody else. That's what the law will produce. A judgment, judgmental attitude. It's all about the rules. Remember what happened to Jesus and his disciples? They would, they would constantly, the religious leaders would constantly come to Jesus asking him why they aren't following this rule, that rule, all these different lists of rules. And they're starting to evaluate other people's life rather than looking in their own heart what was happening. Paul says we have to be careful. So we don't think the worst of others. We think the best of people. We think the best of them. So we remain humble because the cross is level ground. Now, there are going to be mindsets that we have when it comes to being under the law. It, it produces in you this heart of, of well, I just want to do the bare minimum. I just, how far can I go? How, how close to the line can I get? How, is this sin really a big deal as that sin? It, it starts to produce in you this heart of doing the bare minimum rather than the opposite, opposite side is that, no, I... It's not how close I get to the line. It's how far I get away from it. It's how far I get away from sin. It's not how close I get to sin. It's how far I can get away from it. And so Paul will elaborate on that topic, especially when it comes to the mentality. The law demands perfection. Demands perfection. The law demands perfection. In other words, Paul uses this illustration. This this is also be used in our own society. If you break one law, how many know you're a lawbreaker? That goes for the law too. The law states 
all these different things. And if you break it one time, you're a lawbreaker. Paul says this is what it does. It demands perfection. Christian life, being under grace, shows me I, can be, I can't be perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm under the grace of God. And so rather than looking at something and saying, I've got to be perfect in every area of my life, I'm praying, Lord, I know I can't be perfect in every area of my life, but help me to develop consistency in my life. Help me to be consistent in my words, in my actions, in my thoughts. Help me to develop that within me. Because you could be setting yourself up for failure, which when you do that, what does it produce? Well, if you're under the law, it will produce shame, guilt, condemnation every time. Because you can never, ever measure up. And you'll be constantly trying to gain God's approval of his love for you when he's already given it to you. But with the mentality of being under grace, you're going to realize, I trust God's word, not my feelings. I trust God's word, not my feelings. I rest in his, his word. I rest in who he is because that's the new way of living. It's not external. It's internal. It's the opposite. I'm flying through these three points today because I want to get to point number three because each and every one of these points could be a sermon in itself. Okay, as I looked at this, I'm like, this could be a sermon all in its own. So we're going to go to the next point, point number two, which is about now how do we view the law, right? There's a wrong view, but there's also the right view of how we view this law that Paul is talking about. And this is what he says in verse 7 through 12. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not known what sin was if it had not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had said, you should not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of, of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when commandment came, sin sprung to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded, the command, afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then... The law is holy, righteous, and, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. So Paul understands what he has just explained. People are going to have a view about the law that somehow the law is actually sinful when the law is not sinful. Because you know why? Guess who gave the law? Who gave the law? God gave the law. So is God sinful? No. So what is Paul saying? Is that sin realizes what the law states, and now it works to make you break it. And guess what naturally is inside of you? Sin. So sin is springing to life all of a sudden because it wants you to fall short of it every single time. And so this is what Paul is stating, is that this, the law itself is not, is not sinful. It is holy, righteous, and good, right? We've talked about this. Holy is, is pureness. It's pure because what? 